Hello there, I'm Tyler Griffin, and this is Scripture Study Insights by Scripture Central. Today, 1 Nephi chapters 16 through 22. As we finish off the book of 1 Nephi today, there are incredible stories in here that we're going to spend a little bit of time covering, as well as our first introduction to the book of Isaiah in the Book of Mormon. We get two chapters. Before we dive into the actual block of scriptures, I want to just share with you one of my favorite uh, lifelong learning perspectives on, on how to get more out of my scripture study. And I'm going to do it this way. I'll just, I'll diagram a scripture page here on the screen. And so you've got all these pages of holy writ that come down to us from, from prophets in ages past. And one thing that you'll find is that there are really three domains, three dimensions, if you will, or, or spheres or worlds associated with your scriptures and your scripture study. The first dimension, so I'll just label this as number one, the first dimension is the world or the sphere or the domain that resides underneath the scripture pages, underneath the words. If you were to pick up those words and look underneath them, you will find an entire world filled with people, with culture, with traditions and customs and societal norms and languages, often many languages, not just the one being spoken, but sometimes the one being spoken and then the one that's actually being written. We see that, for instance, in the New Testament where Jesus and his apostles are speaking predominantly Aramaic, but the New Testament books are being then written in Greek and then later translated into Latin and into English and other languages. In the Book of Mormon, you have a group of people who are speaking Hebrew and forms of Hebrew through, through time, but the words are being scratched into metal plates using Egyptian characters. So there's, there's already a, a translation going on in the actual world underlying the actual scripture page. So this world is big. It's, it's vast, and for many people, it's kind of complicated and complex, and so some people are scared of it. This world right here happens to be the purview of, of many biblical scholars or scriptural scholars where they spend all, if not most, of their time studying and immersing in the worlds that have produced these scriptures for us, studying the languages and the, and the connections there. Now we come to the second dimension of scripture study. It's the, the words on the actual page. It's what you can see sitting in front of you, and it is a whole world or a dimension all to its own. You have in this dimension, you have repeat words, you have uh, doctrines, principles, stories, speeches, conflict, you have relationship struggles and relationship successes, you have people doing all kinds of things, good and bad and everything in between, you have people moving towards God and people moving away from God. It's this whole world that the Lord gives to us that resides on the actual page in the language in which you're reading the scriptures. This world now it's big enough, this dimension, this sphere is big enough that it could take all of our time looking at the words that are on the page and, and just doing extensive studies for the rest of our lives, and it would be inexhaustible. We would never get to the bottom of it. Uh, Elder Maxwell used to refer to it as the inexhaustible gospel. Well, the same could be said for the world or the dimension that lives under the scriptures. You could spend your entire life in that, in that world or in that sphere and never get to the bottom of it because there's so much time and history and culture going on there. Now we get to the third dimension. 
If you want your scripture study to become more three-dimensional, then don't leave out the world that lives above the scripture page. The world that these words and the, the culture and history that produce these words, that they actually have the capacity to create this, this dimension or this sphere for us, this world, if you will, in which we live. This is the realm of application where we say, okay, so I learned those principles or I saw that teaching or I was introduced to that doctrine on the scripture page, but how does it translate into my life? How does it help me build my relationships with God, with the Savior, Jesus Christ, with my loved ones, with my enemies, with others? How does it influence who I am and how I live my life? Brothers and sisters, the beauty of this three-dimensional view of scriptures is to say that there's, it's not a competition. It's not like one of these worlds is the best and the others are, are lesser siblings in the scriptural family. The idea being that if you can find ways to increase your knowledge, your ability to see and seek for truth, in any one of the three spheres will actually enhance your capacity to find greater meaning in the other two realms as well, in the other two dimensions. So it would be, let, let me give you just a scenario. If somebody were to say, you know what, I, I don't care about the languages of the scriptures, I, I don't care about learning anything about Hebrew or about Greek, there, there's some pretty good precedence for this. The prophet Joseph Smith, the further he got into his prophetic ministry, especially interacting with scripture, the more he became interested in diving into the world underneath the scriptures. He wanted to learn Hebrew. He hired a, a Hebrew teacher. He wanted to learn Greek. He wanted to create a, a grammar and, and learn how to read and decipher Egyptian. He, he read in German. He, he wanted to know all of these different uh, aspects underlying the scriptures and the world that produced those scriptures. And if you look at President Russell M. Nelson, he, he has spent a lot of time looking at these worlds that are underlying the scriptures, looking at what the, the word, for instance, repentance comes to us in English from the Greek, metanoeo, looking at the word chesed from the Hebrew. That's all stuff that our, our prophets give us that reside in the world underneath the scriptures. So you could spend some time, for instance, in Webster's 1828 dictionary if you're trying to make more sense of the Book of Mormon and you want to understand this world here. You could begin at the scripture page level, on the page, looking for words that you, we assume we understand what they mean, or maybe they're confusing to us, look them up in the Webster's 1828 dictionary and you'll get a better idea of what they meant in the day in which the Book of Mormon was translated in 1829 and 1830. And that will increase your ability to then create more wisdom and more discipleship and more conversion, not just for yourself, but for those that you, you teach and interact with in the world that we live in today. And as you move forward, what's more, you can, you can enhance your study of the scriptures by paying attention to some of the things that are created in this dimension or this sphere that resides above the scriptures, especially if you pay more time and attention to what the prophets are telling us about the scriptures. They live in this world of ours that, that resides above the scriptures, and there is an authority that is given to prophets, seers, and revelators when it comes to scriptures that nobody else has. Nobody else has access to certain things like the prophets do, and yet we live in a world that almost encourages people to not listen to the prophets but to say, no, come learn of me. That's thin ice from my perspective when the prophets have made certain things clear 
in the scriptures, we should probably pay attention to those and figure out how to better apply them in our own life. So, in quick review, a three-dimensional view of the scriptures will look a little bit like a house fitly framed together. We begin at the lowest level with a nice foundation, our, our basement, if you will, the under, so starting with a U here, with that shape, and then we go to the O, building the walls and the floor of our house, that world that is on the page of the scripture, and then we end with the roof over our house that is fitly framed together, above the application of all those principles. And brothers and sisters, it's a better experience when that house is fitly framed together in a way that makes sense for you. Now, some are going to spend more time underneath in that world, and some are going to spend more time on the page in that dimension and that sphere, and others are going to spend more time above it. That's fine, but the invitation is don't ignore the other dimensions. Make, make them all come to, to bear in our study of the Book of Mormon this year and see if it deepens your appreciation for these scriptures and their ability to change your life and to, to provide those things that you need to move forward on the covenant path. Now, with that foundation, let's dive in. So, chapter 16 is where we start our story today. We're out in the wilderness. Nephi is speaking to his brothers, declaring unto them truth, and they say, you're, you're giving us hard things. And he continues to work with them until they hearken to the truth, and then verse 4 says, And it came to pass that I, Nephi, did exhort my brethren with all diligence to keep the commandments of the Lord. I love this. He's working with them in their real-world setting to keep the commandments of the Lord, and where are they getting many of the commandments? It's from the Lord directly through Revelation to Lehi, the prophet, as well as on the scriptures. So, they humbled themselves, and then we can start progressing. They all get married, and Nephi mentions that he had been exceedingly blessed of the Lord. I love that. Ever since the day I got married, I have been exceedingly blessed of the Lord. Most of the blessings that, that God has given me in my life, as I, if I were to sit down and count my many blessings, I can't think of any of them that I would be able to say, oh, I accomplished that with just the Lord and me alone without the help of Kiplin, my angel, my bride. Everything good that has fl flowed um, from heaven into my life she's been either at my side or been the source or, or directly related to that uh, experience of feeling exceedingly blessed of the Lord, like Nephi. So then we're introduced to the Leahona, chapter uh, 16, verse 10, this round ball of curious workmanship, and I love looking at this Leahona th through the lens of or from the perspective of scriptures like we have here. You've got a ball, a round ball of curious workmanship, and, and if we're not careful, we'll spend so much time trying to figure out what the Liahona looks like or where it came from or who delivered it and, and how it actually works and functions that we might miss the messages that are written on the book or the directions that are given on the ball or the directors, which would then mean we totally miss the point of where it's trying to lead us. So, if you look at this, there, there are some powerful indicators of how they interacted with the Liahona that I think would benefit me today and you and all of us collectively if we paid a little more attention to the world that resides on the scripture page associated with this Liahona or this director, this compass pointing the way to them. Now, what does the Liahona do? Let's just grab a couple of verses here. Verse 16, we did follow the directions of the ball, which led us in the more fertile parts of the wilderness. You recognize that they're, they're going through a part of the land that we assume they've never been through before. They're having to be guided by this, this compass or this director, and they needed to know where the more fertile parts of the wilderness would be, and how do they, 
How do they stay in those fertile parts? Notice verse 28 and 29, it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld the pointers which were in the ball, that they did work according to the faith and diligence and heed which we did give unto them. And there was also written upon them a new writing which was plain to be read, which did give us understanding concerning the ways of the Lord, and it was written and changed from time to time according to the faith and diligence which we gave unto it. And thus we see that by small means the Lord can bring about great things. We always uh, tend to, to credit Mormon with the and thus we see phrase. Nephi is the first one to use it in the Book of Mormon here. He's giving you the lesson. It's small means whereby the, the Lord brings about great things, like a little round ball of curious workmanship, like the world that resides on the pages of Scripture, like the world that resides in the realm of prophetic teachings and warnings and directions that are given to us. It's beautiful when you see how they, when they're faithful and they're giving heed to what God's telling them, they stay in the more fertile parts of the wilderness. When they're unfaithful, God doesn't smite them, he just gives them direction that they don't pay attention to, and so they end up in non-fertile places. Same thing with our scripture study, same thing with giving heed to the words of the living prophets that God has given us today. So, with that, we start off on our journey, and you notice in verse 18, it came to pass that as I, Nephi, went forth to slay food, behold, I did break my bow. And we, we talk more about all of these principles in the, the legacy, uh, the repeats of the videos that Taylor Halverson and I did four years ago in the Book of Mormon. So, for, for greater discussion on each of these points, you can refer back to those. I'm just hitting them quickly as we go through in, in this series. So, you, you'll notice there that he takes ownership. He uses the active voice, I did break my bow. He doesn't say my, bro my bow did break. He, he, he's 100 percent responsible. If you've never read the talk by uh, Elder Lynn G. Robbins, given at BYU in an education week called Be 100 percent responsible, I would highly recommend it to you in the context of taking the principles from Scripture and not sitting back and making excuses for why we're not keeping them or why bad things are happening, but to take ownership over our life and to change the way we see our role in this covenant progression and our responsibilities with those around us as well. It's a powerful talk. Once again, it's called Be 100 percent Responsible. Now, uh, Ishmael dies in verse 34, and he's buried at a place that is called Nahom. And you'll notice it wasn't the Lehi group that named it Nahom. It was already named Nahom, and, and that location, there is a location right in the route that Nephi's been describing that we have found, archaeologists have found, that is called Nahom, this place of consolation and, and sorrowing. So then, uh, after claiming that they're going to slay Father Lehi now and Nephi as well, Laman and Lemuel and some of the others who have been complaining and murmuring, they're, they're subdued and it says, verse 39, it came to pass that the Lord was with us, yea, even the voice of the Lord came and did speak many words unto them. Because they've been saying, they've been claiming Nephi's been using his power to to trick us with what he's putting on the Liahona, as if it's this magical instrument that he's taking away the ruling of the people out of their hands. So it's the voice of the Lord that comes to them and chasten them ex exceedingly. And now we get into chapter 17. Uh, we are given the command through Nephi to build a ship. Now, can you picture the response when Nephi comes down off of the mountain and starts making tools. 
I can picture Laman and Lemuel looking at him saying, Nephi, come on, what, what are you doing? What do you think you're doing? You've never, you've never built any kind of boat before, let alone a, an ocean-going vessel. Come on. And I love this because, you see, it would be very easy for Nephi to give ear to the voice and the, the, the wisdom, quote-unquote, of the world and to get discouraged. But Nephi has a different vision. Re remember what happened to him back in chapter 11, 12, 13, and 14? When, when the Spirit of the Lord and then an angel showed him multiple scene changes of all these things that would transpire in the future? Well, one of those big chapters, chapter 12, was all about the Nephite and Lamanite scenes in the New World. And, and Nephi saw his posterity and Laman and Lemuel's posterity in the New World, which means Nephi has a different perspective on this command to build a ship than Laman and Lemuel do. He, he knows some things that they don't. So when God said build a ship, Nephi's saying, okay, so that's how God's going to bring to pass these things that I've already seen. And I love the steadiness that comes with prophets of God who have seen things, who know things. So there's no hesitation on Nephi's part. He says, I'm going to build a ship and God's going to help me do it and I need some ore to make some tools. I know I'm going to have to start there, so that's how he, he begins with the Lord. The command comes in verse 8 to construct the ship, and verse 9 he says, Lord, whither shall I go that I might find ore to molten, that I might make tools to construct the ship? He, he knows it's going to happen, and I love that steady faith. What he didn't know was how he was going to do it. And I think that we can see that pattern with our prophets, our seers, and our revelators today. They will often get these revelations of what we need to do, and they'll make announcements. They'll, they'll give us some direction to do things in a higher and holier way, and they don't always give us the handbook of how. God expects us to give faithful, diligent heed to the words that he's giving us in our world today, not just from the world of the past on the scriptures, but our modern prophets as well, and then we get to figure out the how, which Nephi models beautifully how to thrive in this world above the scripture page or above the words of the prophets or the direct uh, direction given by God. So, we get this long chapter 17 where his brothers are bearing a false testimony to him in verse 21 and 22, uh, telling Nephi, we might have been happy if we had been allowed to stay in Jerusalem. And the reality is, is if they had stayed in Jerusalem, they probably would not have been any happier than they are out here because happiness isn't dictated by where you live. Happiness is dictated by how you live. And so they're telling him in verse 22, we know that the people in Jerusalem are righteous. We know that, that, that they're good. So they're bearing this testimony, and then notice how Nephi follows it up, verse 25. Ye know, ye know, ye know, three times in verse 25, two times in verse 26, one time in verse 27, one time in 28, and one time in 29. Are you noticing? We're living now, we're swinging around in this world, this dimension on the scripture page, looking for these repeat words and phrases. It's beautiful to see how Nephi counters what they were claiming to know with what he knows. And because of his visions and because of his prophetic insight, he does know some things that they don't yet. So he's trying to, to teach them. Now, when you get over to the uh, beginning of chapter 18, it says, it came to pass that they did worship the Lord, Lord and did go forth with me and we did work timbers of curious workmanship. I love that. Workmanship. Did you catch it? They're building a ship using curious workmanship. I, I, I think this is more than just a, a, a fun play on words that, that's residing in this, this world of the scripture page, because I think what it does is it, 
it provides an opportunity for us to then reflect above the scripture page in our life today at the various ships that the Lord is asking you and me to build, both individually and collectively. There, there are relationships that maybe you've never had to build before or repair before. There might be companionship in missionary settings or, or other uh, relationships there. There might be courtship or scholarship or leadership or citizenship or friendship, fellowship, mentorship. You, you can look these up. A fun exercise for a family or a class would be in 60 seconds write down as many English words as you can think of that end in the words or in the letters S-H-I-P, ship, and go and see how many they can come up with. It's fascinating because there are so many of them and then to have people pick the one that they're working on building right now and say, if Nephi were to jump off of the page out of the world of 600 BC into our world that's here above the scripture page, what might he tell us about building our ships today? Brothers and sisters, I, I think he might say there was a lot more going on than building a disciple's ship to get us across the ocean. I think he might say one of the most important ships you have to learn how to build is your discipleship through your worship of the Lord. Notice how he goes on to say what he did, the Lord did show unto me from time to time after what manner I should work the timbers of the ship. It's time to time. Things aren't given all at once up front, even to incredible prophets like Nephi. You, you have to be patient with this process. Verse 2, now I, Nephi, did not work the timbers after the manner which was learned by men, neither did I build the ship after the manner of men. I think it would be safe to say because he hadn't spent a lot of time down at the shipyards of 600 BC. Jerusalem isn't near the ocean, relatively speaking. So, it, of course it's not going to be built the way most men would have built ships in the day. He says, but I did build it after the manner which the Lord had shown unto me, wherefore it was not after the manner of men. I think there's a principle here for us in building our relationships today, not after the manner of the world, but after the manner that the Lord shows us. In verse 3, I, Nephi, did go into the mount oft, and I did pray oft unto the Lord, wherefore the Lord showed unto me great things. I love the fact that he's not relying on the, the experts of the world. He's relying on God throughout the entire process of building this ship that is then going to take them across the sea. And you get that voyage across the ocean in the rest of chapter 18 with the storm and being driven back. You get all that story and then the landing in the new world and the establishment of the, the colony over here. And then he introduces us in chapter 19 to his process of making plates. And he's telling us a little bit about this and his relying on the records. And he tells you in verse 9, the world because of their iniquity shall judge him, being the Messiah, uh, to be a thing of naught, wherefore they scourge him, and he suffereth it, and they smite him, and he suffereth it. Yea, they spit upon him, and he suffereth it, because of his loving kindness and his long suffering towards the children of men. And then he quotes three prophets in rapid succession in verse 10, Zenak, Nahum, and Zenus. And everything he's quoting from Zenak, Nahum, and Zenus, are things that Nephi is a witness of from chapter 11 in 1st Nephi. It has to do with Jesus Christ and what would happen to him. And then verse 11 it says, for thus spake the prophet. And then it goes on. Can I just give you something to look for if you like to mark your scriptures? In this sphere of living in the domain of the words on the page, look for the word prophet or prophets 
in chapter 19, 20, 21, 22, and see what happens when you notice how Nephi uses that, that word or that label, prophets, and how God feels about these chosen servants of his. And then ask yourself the question as you transfer from the dimension of on the scripture page to our world today, and perhaps we could ask ourselves the question, how do we feel about the prophets that God has given us? How much are we trusting in them the way that Nephi is trusting in the prophets that he had in his scripture pages and in his day back in 600 BC? It's beautiful. Now he jumps into chapter 20 and 21. If you want to uh, have a lot of fun, dive in here with the perspective, swim around in these pages with more understanding beneath the words of the pages about Isaiah. This is your first introduction to Isaiah in the Book of Mormon, living a hundred plus years before Nephi here in Jerusalem, but his whole focus is on trying to get people to come into this covenant connection with God and to be gathered into the house of Israel. So read chapter, nine, or chapter 20 and 21 through the lenses of the gathering of Israel and find more meaning in the world of Isaiah's day that produced these words, find meaning in the words that are residing on that page, and then don't end there, make your scripture study three-dimensional by paying attention to what our modern prophets and apostles have told us about the scattering and now the subsequent gathering of Israel of which we are all being invited to take a major part in in these, the latter days. And then he finishes with chapter 22 with Nephi giving you his conclusion. So 19 is his introduction to Isaiah, 20 and 21 are the two chapters from Isaiah, and then 22 is his conclusion. To finish up, brothers and sisters, discipleship is fueled and motivated and enhanced by understanding God's will for us, by understanding the doctrines and the principles and the truths that he would have us incorporate into our lives, and we can find many of them on the pages of Scripture by better understanding the worlds that created those Scripture pages, but we can also understand them better by paying attention to the worlds and the dimensions that those Scriptures create for us today and the ability that our prophets have to be able to give us ongoing direction from God on high as we move forward building all kinds of ships in all parts of the world. I know God lives. I know that Jesus is the Christ and I know that he loves and upholds his prophets and he does that because he loves you and me and he wants us to know the truth and that is the pattern that he has chosen to give the whole world some of these big truths and then he will give us our individual truths through the power of the Holy Ghost in our own spheres of influence and to govern our own lives. And for that, all of those three dimensions of scriptures and their study, for that I am so grateful. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Know that you're loved and happy studying. At Scripture Central, we are committed to building enduring faith in Jesus Christ by illuminating the Book of Mormon and other Restoration Scripture, making them more accessible, defensible, and comprehensible to people everywhere. One way we do this is by offering all of our world-class resources for free. We hope that by using these resources, you can take your study to the next level and unlock levels of understanding for your life. One of these tools is the Gospel Learning App, which takes you on a curated study path into the specific topics relating to this week's Come Follow Me content. This week in the Gospel Explorer, you can take the left path to learn more about godly sorrow and repentance. The middle pathway dives deep into a study of agency and responsibility. Lastly, you can take the path upon the right to study how you can better fulfill a difficult or challenging calling. These paths and resources are here to help you come closer to your Savior, Jesus Christ. As always, it is our hope that you deepen your conversion to him as you study his words and immerse yourself in the scriptures.